Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Talking Tax with Tom Yamachika, who joins us today to discuss getting the kids to school in PA. And I, I would like to open the show with a resounding aloha, because this is the study of the new aloha in Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Tom. Aloha. <laughs> What's going on in PA? Well, we are focusing our attention this week on Kihei because a, a a new high school is going to be open there. It's called Kulani Hakoi High School. I hope I got the pronunciation right. And it cost $245 billion. Problem is, for a long time, it couldn't open. And we're going to talk about why. Let's talk about schools in general for a minute, you know. Ihe must be a fast-growing place, or they had another school that was not up to snuff, so they had to build a new one for $245 million. That's a lot of bread. Um, and, I, and I just wonder what the, what, what the track these days is on building new schools, because there's a lot of schools that uh, are underpopulated. Uh, and the, you know, I'm not sure why in Ihe they had to build a school for $245 million. Would you comment on that? Well, uh, previous to this new school being built, uh, the, uh, the students who lived in Kihei were being serviced by uh, other high schools in other parts of the island, and they had to be bused there. So uh, the kids had to kind of endure long bus rides going both directions for a very long time, and uh, ultimately, Lawmakers had enough of that, and they said, all right, doggone it, to DOE, please build a new school there, and uh, it's, it's now built. Uh, is so it the, built up to standard? I mean, you know, we had a show uh, a week or two ago about air conditioning in the schools. And oh, like, yeah, that, that, that's no problem. It's brand bank and new, uh, lives up to all those standards, but there is one issue, and let me kind of show you what it is. Uh, can you uh, can you put up that map there? Okay, see the uh, the red pin on the right is the location of the high school. Uh, I'm not sure how how much it's it's uh, built up uh, since the you know since this photo was taken, but as you can see, the high school's on the right, all the houses are on the left, and there is this uh, highway. This is Piilani Highway in the middle, separating the two. So. Uh, the concern has been, and has been for a very long time now, how you get the kids across the highway to the school. Back in 2013, which, as you, as you know, is 10 years ago, uh, the State Land Use Commission said, well, as a condition to building the school over here, what you got to do is provide a grade-separated crossing, which means either an overpass or an underpass. And those were the rules of the game uh, since 2013. And over the years, uh, DOE was, you know, planning along those lines. Uh, when it uh, uh, approached Maui County for permits, um, yeah, this was in 2020. I mean, I don't know why it took seven years, but it took seven years. It said the design of the pedestrian overpass was already started and projected for it to be built uh, either in 2022 or 2023. But did that happen? No, not at all. What happened in 2021 was that DOE kind of had a change of heart and they decided hey, let's go back to the Land Use Commission and, and try to get them, change, get them to change their mind. About they want About uh, opening the school without a pedestrian crossing. So the kids would cross the highway without the, without the cross? Uh, without an overpass or an underpass. So you, you would have, could have traffic lights or you have a crosswalk. Um, and, and DOE said uh, that, you know, you know, these... Uh, the overpass or underpass really isn't necessary, and and the attached uh, to their request studies. Guess who paid for those studies? 
Mm. Uh, presumably showing that the pedestrian crossing wasn't needed. That uh, the community, uh, the folks in, in Kihei in that neighborhood that we showed you, uh, they wouldn't stand for it. Uh, that, that attracted uh, objections and demonstrations uh, from the public. And ultimately what happened was that the Land Use Commission denied the Lee's request. Okay, so eight years have passed. DOE knew that it had to build an overpass or an underpass. They didn't do it. And they tried to get the Land Use Commission to change their mind. Uh, and the Land Use Commission said no. So now we have a school built? There's, There's more. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> There's oh, more. That's worse. At, at the same time, um... They were kind of talking to the Department of Transportation because they, you know, they have a jurisdiction over the road, P. Ilani Highway. And the Department of Transportation spent $16 million on a four-lane roundabout with flashing lights in front of the school to slow traffic down. And, and so in, in DOE's mind, that's all we need. You know, we don't need, we don't need the overpass. We don't need the under underpass. Uh, you know, the so let me ask you, what is the cost of the underpass or overpass? Is it more or less than $68 million? We'll get to that. Okay. It's going to be, it's going to be more now. Now it's going to be more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, when they did this, uh, the county officials were skeptical. And in late August 2022, uh, they said, okay, let's have a meeting with the community. So they showed up. Council members showed up. Other community members showed up. And they invited the DOE. Nobody from the DOE showed up. Nobody. They said they weren't invited, which, which is kind of hard to believe. Um... But nobody showed up. Fast forward to February of this year. Um, DOE seemed to uh, be reading the handwriting on the wall. And they presented some rough sketches to the community uh, about what a, an overpass would look like. And DOE said that it would ask uh, the legislature for emergency funding. And at that point, um, uh, Senator Angus McKelvey, who, you know, whose senatorial district encompasses that area, uh, he, he did, in fact, ask the legislature for $15 million uh, to cover that, uh, the cost of the over. That's and less than $16 million. $15 million. Uh, but that's less than sixteen million. It is, and um, but it got reduced to zero in the budget negotiations. So um, apparently, the house didn't like it for some reason, and uh, maybe the answer was, and we have to speculate about this, but the, maybe the answer was that the construction would cost more. Because at, at about the same time, the governor's office issued a release saying that the construction of the overpass would cost about $25 million plus. Okay. So, uh, this, of course, did not satisfy the county. I don't blame them. Uh, and they uh, were asked to issue a, a permit allowing the school to open, at least conditionally, and they said no. You know, we didn't. We don't want to have the blood of, you know, the the, the blood of, you know, roadkill students on their hands. Is this so, an action of the county council or just a, some administrative body? I think it was on the building department side, but uh, lots of people were involved in the county's decision because uh, Mayor Bisson did come out and and, and speak about that. What's his uh, position? Well. Uh, he doesn't want dead kids. 
Good man. Yeah. All right. So uh, at that point, um, high-level negotiations started happening, uh, spearheaded, well, either, either spearheaded or participated in by Governor Green. And, and they were trying to reach a deal um, to allow the school to open. And in, in March of this year, they did, in fact, reach a deal. So under the terms of the deal, DOE is going to implement a temporary pedestrian safety plan, uh, including shuttles for students who are walking to and from school. And uh, they, they, they said that the state is going to hold the county harmless for anything, you know, bad that happens uh, under the temporary pedestrian safety plan. And, of course, the, then, then the county's obligation under the deal was to let the school open. So the school is going to open. It's going to open next month in August uh, under those conditions. But let's kind of look at where we are. Uh, we're 10 years down the pike. The overpass slash underpass wasn't built. We have a, uh, a, round, a four-lane roundabout with flashing lights, which, which probably um, antagonizes everybody. Because, you know, the, the cars going on, on, on P. Ilani Highway, they're, you know, they're zipping by, and, and they don't want to, you know, uh, break to 25 or whatever to, to go through the overpass. Uh, the kids are still afraid. Uh, and, and they're, and they're worried about being roadkill, just like everybody else. Parents are, are anxious. Um, and that it's an inconvenience to, to, uh, you know, go on the shuttle, especially if you got to wait a long time for it, you know, with driver shortages and what have you. Uh, and, and it's, it's kind of really a sad situation. I mean, the, the good news is that the school's opening. But the bad news is that you've had all this infighting uh, between different state agencies, DOE, Department of Transportation, Land Use Commission, uh, Maui, Maui County. And guess who pays for all the fighting? We do. We, we, we taxpayers do. You know, the, what, back in the day, there were, there were uh, street monitors with, who had little stop signs you know, red and white stop signs. And, and if there were some kids crossing the street or a crosswalk, what have you, they could pull the stop sign up and the traffic would all stop. What about that? You know, if you had like maybe a, a 25 or 30 mile per hour road, that might work. You got peel on highway, it's probably not going to work. I mean, those, those road monitors would probably fear for their lives too. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't blame them. So what happens? Then? You know, I, I mean, are are parents going to send their kids to this school? This is really such a downer um, for the DOE. I mean, because they build a school and they won't come. But what kind of a school is that? You know, that's 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 the sad part. Um, you know, you expect government uh, to provide services for people. Uh, you, you, you expect government to, to solve problems, get things done. Instead, what happened here is everybody spent a lot of time and a lot of money fighting amongst themselves and stuff didn't get done. Well, you, you, That's the you, know, you, you think that some, some, um, political official will emerge and say, damn it, we have to solve this problem. When the school is opening, I want it to open. There, there has to be an overpass. I want it to be built. Build it. You guys work for, you know, the chief executive of the county or the state. I want this done. Is anybody doing that? Sadly, uh, nobody right now. I mean, we, we don't even know whether, 
whether DOE is finally consenting to have that overpass built. So uh, let's let's look to assign blame, um, and and I yeah I, you can't say oh everyone's to blame. This is a systemic blame. Now who's at the top of the list? To me, top of the list is DOE. They had their marching orders ten years ago. Oh, I didn't think build a damn overpass if they if if they were told point blank you got to do it. Well, that's an executive issue, isn't it? You can say what well, you can fob that off on some board of directors somewhere, but it's the executive that has to stand and explain. Uh, well, with 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 the with the DOE, it's kind of uh, a little bit different because uh, the superintendent of education doesn't report to the governor. He he she reports to the board, the board of education. Hmm. And and their elected officials as well. Yeah, that's kind of technical though, because at the end of the day, where's the media been on this? And you know, you know the story that you just recited, um, you know, has, has been in the media recently. But what about the last ten years? You think the media would be shrieking about it? Has it? Well, um, not. I mean, th there's been media coverage, I think, since 2020. Uh, where when when a lot of this was going on, but but before then, not not so much. I mean, what happened to the seven years between 2013 and 2020? Um, I don't know. I guess they were they were going out getting RFPs or whatever that they were building the school. I mean, things things seemed to be going okay. The school was being built, so probably wasn't viewed as newsworthy at the time. What about the legislature? The legislature, you know, the, and the uh, the chairs of the um, uh, committees on education in both the House and the Senate could have said, we want it built. Build it. Here's some money. Did anything like that happen? Or are they Well the, again, that's that's what that's what Senator McKelvey tried to do. And and he got twenty five million dollars in the budget uh from the Senate side. The House took it out. Why they took it out, I don't know. And Rip, Rip Yamashita's not saying. Embarrassing. You know, it kind of falls on him to explain, but he doesn't explain. That's the way the ledge works, isn't it? So, okay, so there are a couple of things that, that come out of this. One is deciding the blame, and that's like there's plenty to go around, but, that, you know, you can focus on individuals and institutional structures here, uh, like the DOE, but at the at the end of the day, this is um, this is bigger than that high school in PA. This is a statement of how state government work, right? I I think what we're seeing and and what we have seen uh, is a lot of systemic issues in DOE. Uh, DOE is very very big. It's one of the biggest state agencies. It has one of the biggest budgets. Um. But it's got all kinds of problems. It's got deferred maintenance issues. It's got the issues that we talked about last time. It's it's got the uh, you know we can't get new schools open kind of issues, uh, at least here. And you know who knows what else is out there. What one of the problems is and always has been uh, that they keep their own records very very close to the chest, so as to evade scrutiny by you know other. Uh, watchdog groups like us uh, who have been trying to get behind uh, the so-called Iron Curtain for, 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 for decades. So it sounds to me like we need reform. And I'll take your point. We need reform at DOE. Where would you start? We don't know. I mean, the the the, the problem the problem is that there's this you know iron veil uh, that nobody seems to be able to pierce. So maybe we start by getting rid of that, uh, making sure that the you know DOE's fiscal systems are are more transparent and that can be scrutinized by you know watchdog groups like uh, uh, us, the education associations. 
you know, there's, there's other nonprofits that um, uh, profess to be able to analyze, uh, you know, budgets and that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that you always worry about, or at least I, I always worry about, is that the bigger the organization is, the easier it is to hide stuff. So, well, that has to change. That has to change. I mean, what the law, you know, allows for the, you know, our citizens to request information, and they have a right to get it. The FOIA law. Uh, why is it so troublesome? Why can't you, the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, or other organizations, or interested individuals, a parent, for example, make a FOIA request and expect to get it? Um, one. And we were about this before. Uh, one education association, it was a nonprofit uh, headed by a gentleman named uh, uh, Ray LaRue. Uh, they asked for financial records from DOE, uh, didn't get them, sued, and uh, ultimately got some records uh, for, you know, I think it was the uh, 2016 year but they got them in 2018 or 19. So uh, the information had limited value once it popped out. Why was it, why was it delayed? Because that's how long the litigation took. Well, that doesn't be speak of a, a system where you can get things done. And we, as, as you have said, we as taxpayers pay to get things done. In this case, nothing was done. So it seems to me that some, you know, strong steps ought to take place. For example, um, if that board that the uh, superintendent is responding to um, ha hasn't provided information, hasn't explained what happened, or failing that, you know, it can't, can't explain what happened, um, then maybe some of them ought to go. Maybe the superintendent ought to go. Um, you know, what, uh, what about an impeachment? What about getting rid of them? And where is the governor on this? Well, it's it was a uh, an organization that that's that's that big and that complex. It's unclear where to go to start. I mean, certainly you can get rid of the chief executive, uh, but it it may be beyond the chief executive's ability to handle anyway, because uh, some of the you know, some of the subordinates there may be entrenched. And uh, just not listen to, you know, what people above them are telling them. I mean, I've, I've experienced this myself uh, in, you know, large organizations. Um, well, maybe, maybe as a, you know, an iconic maneuver, a, a token, where you say, look, we don't, we don't know what happened here, but you're the chief executive. Uh, this is on your watch as far as we're concerned. Don't give us excuses. You're gone. You're out of here. We are impeaching you. And maybe the next guy will study what happened and not do the same thing. What about that? Well, you, got, <laughs> you certainly you got to find uh, somebody who's willing to take that kind of abuse. Um, you know, who's the successor going to be? And, and there's always the worry that uh, is the successor going to be worse than the predecessor? Can't worry about it. You got to move on. That's what I think. And, and I don't know, what, how do you... And how do you identify entrenched members of the board so as to do something about it? Well, it may not be the board. It may be the civil servants that are kind of like one or two levels below it, like uh, at the assistant superintendent, the deputy superintendent level. Um, you really, there's no easy way to figure out where the problem, you know, where, no, where, where it's the responsibility of the, uh, the chief executive can do that. Yeah, I'm sure these people are not making mistakes. Like, yeah, that's that's definitely true. I, I mean, it it kind of brings to mind uh, even a few weeks ago, uh, there was news coverage around um, like federal funds that were being made available to the schools uh, to to buy certain kinds of equipment, and the uh, at that point the facilities had kind of wrote a memo to all the schools and saying, "Well, don't take this; uh, it's got to go through us." And, uh, and and we're at that point, you know, the the media was kind of wondering, and we're kind of wondering. All right, so, uh, so what's going to happen? Are you are you just going to like, 
uh, have the schools wither on the vine here, or are, are we going to have some, you know, centralized attention that's going to be, uh, you know, paid and resources given to the schools since it's coming in from the feds and, you know, with, with, with little or no impact to the state budget? You know, what, what's going to happen? We, we never really heard anything about the follow-up, or at least uh, not that I'm aware. Well, it sounds like the, um, you know, the whole education system in the state has to be reformed. It sounds like the house has to be cleaned. There are systems and levels of bureaucracy, everybody talks about it, that are really impossible. This will happen again, and it is probably happening right now, and nobody's doing anything. Nobody can do anything. Um, you know, they're all very comfortable in their layered bureaucracy. Um, so if I made you the legislature, um, and I always wanted to do that, um, what kind of reform would you do? What would that bill say? That's a very, very good question. Um, I mean, certainly you want uh, transparency and accountability. Maybe you just get rid of the Board of Education. There's an idea. Because that sounds like it's the rotten part. And they're all, only too happy to be there and do nothing. Um, and then maybe other things will flow. For example, these layers of bureaucracy will go away. Is it a budget issue? Are they, I mean, I know they're spending more than any other state agency, billions and billions. So the question is, um, uh, can the legislature control this in some way by, um, by re reforming their funding? Well, if they want to get you know, further into the weeds, which I think they should, um, yes. I mean, they, they, they exercise a lot of control over other agencies by putting in budget provisos, saying like, oh, okay, you can spend this money only on this, or you can spend this money if X, Y, and Z happens. Uh, so maybe there should be more of that going on. Well, the intersection is with um, the, the rules about um, exempt and non-exempt um, management positions. You know, hard to get rid of them. Hard to you know decommission a management position in an organization like this. They all say, I've been here forever. I know this more. Um, I'm comfortable, comfortable in what I do. You can't touch me. And I find interesting that the union plays a role in this. Um, I, I knew we'd have to get to that in this discussion, Tom. Where is the union? Which union? There's, there's, there's more than one. The state, I don't know, teachers, the state education union, what is it? How many are there? Well, uh, there are at least three. There's HSC for the teachers, and I, I don't think they're a part of this. There's you'd the, think, actually, you'd think they'd be screaming about it, but never mind. Yeah, you think they'd be screaming about all this, all this stuff that doesn't go on, which should. Then there's H HGEA, which is covering the principals and the administrators. So and maybe that's kind of closer to the to the root of the problem. And then, of course, there's the UPW with covering the custodians and such. And there may there may be others, mm. but uh, uh, so maybe we look at HGEA and what 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 they. Can or, or or will do about it. Well, about the state auditor, we've talked about him before. Well, if the state auditor has has their own problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms I, of uh, in terms of being, you know, seriously taken by the legislature leadership. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're still running their competition with him. And the governor, I asked you about the governor. What, what can the governor do? I mean, this is a serious state problem, and uh, we're never going to have, um, you know, decent government until this and things like this are cleared up. Yeah, maybe, maybe what the governor's got to do is, you know, put in another emergency proclamation in this to the one about housing uh, to get the schools under control. And cut cut through some of the bureaucracy and the red tape, and and you know get some money to the 
uh, places where it's like more urgently needed. I mean, you 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 told me yourself about uh, about times when you were on a neighborhood board and the and the uh, school officials came to you and asked for pencils. I mean, I I think that's disgraceful. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Well, I, have, I give you a scenario, Tom. So I'm in my gubernatorial office, and I ask the superintendent to come and talk to me. And I say, uh, look, you're the superintendent. You work for the people. And government is a service to the people. And you can't distance yourself from that. And you, and you, you have, there are no excuses here. This is a real screw-up. So I want that thing built, and I want it built now. Give me a date by which you can get it built. December. Good. Now build it. And if you don't agree, if you can't manage this, you're useless. And I want your letter of resignation on my desk in the morning. What about that? Well, the first thing he's going to say is, look, I don't have funding for this. As you know, the legislature uh, took up this matter in the last session and they deleted all funding. So I can't really go ahead without defying the legislature. And, and, and my line as governor is, uh, I'm sorry. It, you, perhaps you did not hear what I said. Get it done. You know, we give you a trillion dollars a year to run the schools. Surely you can find a way. Now find a way or find a door. Well, I hope that kind of conversation is being is being held somewhere because it needs to happen. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. But I think this is a a systemic problem that's enormously important. And and I think it, you know, we are going to be tested. Uh, you know, we're going to be tested in our fiscal policy. Um, we're going to be tested in 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 every area of public policy to see whether we can handle it. Why? Because I think there'll be stresses and challenges in the years to come. Even all the issues you and I have talked about, plus climate change, extreme weather, failure of uh, you know community systems and services, they're all on the doorstep. And you know what I worry about is these things will fail at the worst possible time. They, for example, in the, in the event of extreme weather, and the, the people who made the mistakes, who failed to plan, failed to organize, failed to create, um, you know, systems and infrastructure as they should have done, won't be in office anymore. And you can't call them on the phone. They're gone. And who are we going to blame then? Ourselves. So this is the time to act. This is the time to clean it up now. Absolutely. Yeah, again, we're, 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 what we can do is shine a spotlight on problems, and then ho- and then hope that the uh, you know the powers that be uh, can find it in their hearts to you know fix this stuff. Yeah, and the, and the media, the media has to focus on the important things that affect all our lives and the lives of our children, our communities, and they and they can't just go for raw meat. News stories. They have to. They have to follow up on this. Uh, it's it's really critical that the the flame of governmental activity and reform is kept burning for all of us. And it is the media that has to do that. Okay, we're about we're about done, Tom. Sorry to tell you, um, but what message would you leave with the public? Well, what we need to do. Uh... You know, like you mentioned, is we need to have a uh, you know real hard look at some of these agencies, especially the bigger ones, who spend a lot of our money uh, and and do non-productive things like fight with each other. Uh, we we need to have a realization that you know they all work for the people, and they got to focus on getting things done. Not, you know, whose turf is it or whose turf it isn't. Or how I can hide from responsibility. Another That's right. approach. Let's get things done. Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, taking a careful look at how our government works. 
how our various governmental policies work. Tom, um, there's only one, one word that I can say to you at this point in time at the end of our show. Are you ready? I'm ready. Hello. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.